back in the day, the only way McDonald's made money is if there was a paying customer across the cash register from them. Imagine if you went to a McDonald's, you order a Big Mac, and the guy behind the cash register says, hey, just a second, I'll be right back, and walks off to make the Big Mac. Mm. You'd be like, mm -hmm. what kind of operation are they running here? Mm. You know, this isn't very efficient. Yeah. Do it all the time in finance because that's the advisor that goes and builds their own plans. Any activity that takes a financial advisor away from the cash register, away from that meeting, is decreasing the revenue to the firm. Hey everyone, today we are going to get into the fact there are actually three different types of financial advisors versus one, and not knowing the difference, what that means for your practice, how it limits your scale, and the ability to actually create a business model that creates unlimited growth, freedom, and joy in both your business and your life. I'm Brad Johnson, host of the DBDL or Do Business, Do Life podcast. And today we are turning the tables a bit. This was actually an episode that aired on Dave Zoller's YouTube channel, Streamline Your Practice, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The episode must have struck a chord because it is one of Dave's most viewed YouTube videos on his channel. And so I asked Dave permission to re-share it here on our channel, on the Do Business, Do Life podcast, or if you're watching this on YouTube, I give Dave full credit. He is a student of the game. He is one of the most successful financial advisors out there, definitely on YouTube, doing some very cool things. He asks great questions. And so here we are. We're going to reshare it with you. For those that aren't familiar with Dave, I actually had him on my show, uh, episode 21. If you want to go back and give it a listen or search for it here on YouTube, if you happen to be watching, uh, he's actually using YouTube as a marketing funnel. And we got really deep into that. So with that, here's three of our big takeaways. Uh, number one, the characteristics that actually set top advisors apart from the rest. And I've been fortunate to, over the almost the last 20 years, uh, really be in the trenches as a coach to financial advisors uh, when it comes to marketing, to sales, to ops, to culture, to acquiring great talent. So we get into a lot of that in today's episode. We get into really the analogy of how a financial services firm is not that different from a fast food restaurant if it's truly automated and systematized and how lessons from restaurants like McDonald's can actually be applied to scaling your business as a financial advisor. And number three, the four phases of scale. I share a real life story uh, from a triad member, one of our firms that has used this exact model to scale their firm north of $200 million of assets gathered each and every year. In fact, we have one firm this year that will capture north of 300 million in assets. So we get into that as a special give. We've never done this before. In fact, this was inspired uh, by a text string that I just received from another advisor. He's actually working to implement this model, the three different types of advisors, which actually come with three different types of pay structures, depending on which role you are hiring for and creating a career track for. We have actually created a calculator, a model where we can retrofit, kind of reverse engineer this for firms out there that we work with. Uh, this is typically only available to triad member offices, but you're here, you're listening, you're part of our audience. As an offer to you all uh, for being loyal listeners and helping grow the show from the very beginning, uh, we're going to offer that free give, which is a 30 minute private consulting Zoom coaching call where we actually help you understand what the different pay structures look like for each of those roles and how to structure your firm so you're set up to scale and build a business that blesses your life that doesn't become your life. So if that's you, the DBDL Insider Hotline, if you're listening in, that is a number you can text and just text the number, not the word, 69 to 785-800-3235. If you happen to go out to uh, the actual page where this episode lives, which is under bradleyjohnson.com, that's episode 69. There's a form there that you can fill out as well if you'd prefer that. So with that, thanks for listening in or watching in and on to this week's episode. So Brad, you get to talk to uh, and, and really coach a lot of different advisors. You've done that. You've done it for years. Have, can you think of either character traits or or maybe personality traits or just um, or actions? That, who are the advisors that 
that find success and find the growth that they're looking for and then versus those who might struggle. Can you think of the differences between the two? Yes. So here's the here's what comes to mind, Dave. Um, the first place I would start is mindset. Um, the biggest difference between the advisors that have success and it's consistent year over year versus, hey, I just had a stellar year and then kind of went back to, you know, baseline. Um, it's a mindset of continuing to grow. One of the things we say at Triad is, um, and one of the ways we cur curate our community here who are top achievers by, by revenue and by volume in the independent financial advisor space, we say, we check our egos at the door. Um, mm -hmm. No one has ever arrived. We're all lifelong learners. I don't care if you've got 100 million under management, 500 million under management, a billion, 5 billion. We're all still growing and learning and on this journey as a human together. And I, I remember a lesson, Dave, this has been a number of years back, but I was at an, an advisor conference and there was an advisor on stage sharing some best practices and they might've brought in like 5 million of new assets the prior year, which is great. You know, that's, that's a good number for a lot of advisors. And um, I looked at the front row um, and there was an advisor sitting there, notebook open, just scribbling notes. This advisor had brought in over 300 million the prior year. Wow. And they were voraciously taking notes down from an advisor that had done five, a fraction of what they had produced the prior year. And the quote, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I found that to be so true. Um, and you can learn something from everyone. Um, and I've just found the most successful advisors you know, that I've crossed paths with the last 15 years, they have that mindset. They're constantly growing, they're constantly evolving, their ego, and, and by the way, I've seen it work the other way too, Dave, where the ego grows as the production goes, and you know what happens, almost like magic, it's, it's not a good thing. They'll hit this ceiling of complexity. Um, oftentimes the advisor, it's the solo advisor that like kind of grinds their way to that 30, 40, 50 million a year, and then they can't evolve to leader and business owner that can empower a team that can bring on great talent. They cap out. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world because it's like they figured out the game. It's like a video game where they pass one level, but then they can't figure out the next level, the level you get stuck on. I've seen that happen so many times because they stopped growing and evolving. And leadership and building a, a culture that attracts great talent, that's not a natural. You're not just gifted with that. And um, the advisors that continue to grow and evolve and you know, it's not a big enough dream if it doesn't require a team. That's something we say around here a lot. And to build anything of substance, a generational sort of business, you're going to have to have a story that attracts great talent. And then you're going to have to learn how to treat them right and keep them around, or it's always going to come back to you. And that no advisor wants the weight of all of the revenue on their shoulders, from my experience. They want to be able to actually go on vacation, unplug with the family. And it's a beautiful thing when revenue continues to flow in when you're on vacation. And, you know, it takes a team to do that. That's super, super interesting. So if we think about this, the journey that a lot of advisors go on, which is, yes, they're solo, they're figuring it out, they're getting uh, the knowledge, right? They're studying, they're getting the, uh, the letters after their names, and then they're doing it and growing a business. And then, yeah, they get to this point, you know, everything's going great. And then there's that first wall. And if they do nothing about it, it's almost like, I'm picturing like the line graph going up. And then if they do nothing, when they hit this wall, it's just going to go down. And it's those ones at that point or earlier who figure out, how do you know when is the right time? What advice would you give to an advisor? When's the right time to hire? Who do you hire? How do you get, I've talked to advisors who say, you know, I have thought about hiring an assistant or a virtual assistant, but I, I just don't want to pay for, for that person. How, what do you, what's the advice for someone who's, who's at that level? The first quote that comes to mind, by the way, I did not coin this quote, so I'm borrowing it from somebody else. Um, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. And, uh -huh. I, and there's no disrespect to assistants out there because, I mean, Brooke, that's my EA, she's world-class talent. I, I can, She's an executive assistant. She's on the org chart. She is beside me. And um, Michael Hyatt, who I've done a lot of private coaching with, um, is I, we were asked, Sean, my business partner and I, we were in a private coaching session. We said, hey, if you had it to go back, because he, he ran Thomas Nelson. So for those not familiar with him, he ran uh, one of the top 10 book publishing companies. 
in the country, publicly traded, thousand plus employees, published all of Dave Ramsey's books, John Maxwell's books. I mean, these are his personal friends. So he's, you know, kind of been surrounded by thought leadership his entire career. He left that to go start full focus and grew a team, eight figure revenue income very quickly. And with, I think a team of 40 or 50 now, we said, who would your first hire be? Like without hesitation, he said, an EA, an executive assistant. He said, because my time is my most valuable asset. And if I don't have somebody controlling my time and my calendar, I'm not going to be allocating that time wisely. And so when, to answer your question, is yesterday, because if you look at how the analogy we use a lot in the coaching at Triad is, you know, you look at other business models and apply lessons from those to the world of finance. I'll tell you what, McDonald's is a hell of a case study. Um, the most successful franchise <clears throat> in the history of franchises. And if you compare a financial advisor, if it was like a McDonald's, well, back in the day when there had to be a human there to take your order, now you can just do it on the punch screen. But back in the day, the only way McDonald's made money is if there was a paying customer across the cash register from them. That's similar to most financial advisors. The only way you're driving revenue in a financial services firm is if you've got a potential prospect with money across the table from you or across the Zoom from you, depending on your model. Well, essentially at the simplest form, any activity that takes a financial advisor away from the cash register, away from that meeting, is decreasing the revenue to the firm at the base level, at the beginner level. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes advisors are, are doing their own paperwork, they're building their own plans, they're the janitor, they're, they're making the coffee in the morning. So any of those activities, because we all have the finite resource of time that take you out of revenue producing activities hurt your firm. And many of the firms we coach, it starts with the founding advisor, the partners that founded the firm, that's cash register one. And then the next one is service appointments. So if you have any amount of success, now you have to withhold promises to clients mm -hmm. because now you have a growing book of business. Well, if you look at your calendar, and by the way, I've seen many advisors like, I. I can't do an appointment for two weeks. I'm like, well, let's look at your calendar. And all it is is reviews. So basically that would be like a McDonald's where the entire line behind the register is refills, free refills on the cola, right? Because these customers have already paid per se, and now you just have a line of service work. And obviously as a fiduciary, as you know, anybody that runs a great financial services practice, you have to withhold promises or uphold promises, I should say. And so now the service advisor model can actually help you because you think about it, Dave, if you're sitting there doing appointments all day and you've got an inbox that hasn't been answered, if you've got voicemail, you know, light blinking on your phone, you're actually a horrible service advisor already. So the fact that you hire a service advisor that can proactively communicate quicker, the client experience elevates, but back to the cash register analogy, now you actually don't have to leave the cash register as a selling advisor. You can continue to do transactions, which drives revenue, which creates cash flow to hire a bigger team. So now you can have a service advisor, you can have a planning team. The other thing you think about, imagine if you went to a McDonald's, you order a Big Mac, and the guy behind the cash register says, hey, just a second, I'll be right back, and walks off to make the Big Mac. Mm. You'd be like, mm -hmm. what kind of operation are they running here? Mm. You know, this isn't very efficient. Yeah. Do it all the time in finance because that's the advisor that goes and builds their own plans. And nothing against that. There's some world class, like very, you know, CFP, CFA designations. But I will say, if your goal is to grow revenue and help more people, any activity that takes you away from cash register or meeting hurts the productivity of a financial services firm. So that's why many, one of the things we coach on is there's actually three types of advisors. There's a selling or relationship advisor. That's the one manning the cash register. There's a service advisor, the one loving on and carrying on the clients and upholding all the promises and monitoring the financial plan. There's a planning advisor that might be a little more analytical, kind of think CFA engineer mindset. They're the one in the back. By the way, if they focus on that, they're building much more world-class plans than you could ever build being a part-time planning advisor and a full-time selling advisor. So that's just a couple, I mean, there you can continue to dissect that all throughout a financial services firm, but that's mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to mind, Dave, on like the timing of this stuff. Yeah, so the, some of the, the, to sum it up, a few of the, what are they actually gonna be doing? Calendar, email, were two big ones, right? Someone who is replying on your behalf or as the assistant, that seemed like two big things. If that takes up a lot of time. Just that, because I'm thinking like for the person who did, who was hesitant, who is hesitant, 
uh, you don't have to hire a 40 hour per hour uh, per week person, right? You could find the, right. the EA, VA, virtual assistant yeah. that has a few things, right? Well, um, but I, I heard it put once, Dave, to look at the stuff you, you absolutely dread. Actually, Dan Sullivan, uh, we just talked about in the podcast interview we just did. Dan Sullivan, um, I love this that I took from him. He said, what if procrastination was a form of wisdom? And so think about your desk and like the, the pile of paperwork that always piles up on the advisor's desk. Why is that? Because you hate doing it. it. It's like the, I will do that when it's the last thing I have to do. Well, if procrastination was a form of wisdom, look at those things that you dread that are always the last thing you do. If you could write a check and never do that again the rest of your life and actually just stop there, you'd be happier. You'd probably show up at home better. You'd have less on your mind. But the truth is you write a check and never have to do that again. Now that actually frees up time back to the cash register analogy where I can actually see more people. And so it, it not only do you get rid of the things you don't like doing, but you free up time to do the things that you love doing and drive more revenue. And on the, the EA front, I heard it put one time as well, email is someone else's to-do list. Mm -hmm. So if you come in and all you do is bombarded by emails all day, basically you've dedicated your time each day to doing other people's to-do list versus your, versus your own to-do list. And so a great EA, um, inbox management, um, it's Brooke Skoll, who's my EA, um, that I have five emails or less to answer per day. So she will literally answer on my behalf. She'll say, hey, Brad's in a meeting. Do you mind if I hop in and help you out in the meantime? Nine out of 10 people are like, heck yeah, I'm getting faster help here. One out of 10 will be like, hey, yeah, just get this to Brad when he has a moment. So now that's the one you need to personally answer. So inbox management, calendaring, um, do business, do life. You know, the podcast that we do here, that's our mission at Triad. We want to do business and do life. That's integration, not balance is the way we view it. She coordinates with my wife, Sarah. So before I commit to, you know, say we have a, a client dinner flying in, She's going to check with the home front. Hey, are there any ball games that night? Mm -hmm. I got myself in trouble so many times, Dave, where I just overcommit. We're Enneagram sevens. We, we've got fear of missing out. We want to be at every party. And so I would overcommit. And then I would just feel so guilty because I'm like, oh, now I'm going to either disappoint the person that I already committed to or I'm going to miss a ball game. And I just was constantly torn. Think of a great EA as air traffic control for business and life and coordinating that mm -hmm. and making sure you're showing up at the right place at the right time. So Inbox management, uh, calendar management, which, I mean, those two things right there by themselves could be a full-time job. Um, also bookkeeping. So you think about, um, hey, I went out, I need to submit this receipt, list lunch receipt as a business expense. Brooke handles all of that where she's going to monitor those and get those to the accounting team. So those are the, the three real big ones. And by the way, I learned all of that from the guy that wrote the book on it, Michael Hyatt. I've, I've borrowed many of his uh, frameworks for that. What is that book? Uh, it actually, he wrote a book, I think it's called like, be a world-class assistant. Um, he wrote that and then his, I'm trying to, I think they're actually work him and Jim, Jim's his EA, they're, they're working on a course. I don't know if it'll be live by the time this hits the internet, but I think he's doing a course on it too. But yeah, he wrote a book, be a world-class assistant or something like that. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, uh, oh, one uh, other, one other tip, uh, yeah. Belay, B-E-L-A-Y, um, great company. Uh, that was how I found Brooke. So she started out as 20 hours a week. Um, the cool thing is you can grow into this if this is new to you as an advisor. So Brooke started out at 20 and then eventually she's like, I need to be at 40. And then the way Belay works, it's almost like a headhunting firm. I actually bought her out of her contract. So it's a great way to test the concept, get used to the concept. And then if you find the right person where you've got that chemistry, um, can actually hire them on full time. And Brooke, uh, I'm here in Lawrence, Kansas. She's in Atlanta. She'll she'll see like if I've got meetings running through lunch, Chipotle will just show up at the door and she'll be like, hey, so you had meetings running through lunch. And uh, so I went ahead and got you Chipotle. And oh, that's one other, that's one other tool. Um, so there's a worksheet I got from Michael Hyde. He calls it an executive summary. All it is is an Excel doc. It's basically your life on a spreadsheet. So it's frequent flyer number numbers, hotel Marriott numbers. Like if I'm traveling, where do I want to stay? How do I want to get there? How do I take my coffee? You know, what are the local places that I would order lunch from and exactly how my order would be? Uh, my wife's name, my wife's birthday, my kids' names, my, my kids' birthdays, anniversaries. Um, one of his sayings is, it's not lack of intention, it's lack of execution that gets you in trouble. And so, 
Jem and Brooke on my behalf, like my wife's 40th birthday is coming up. It's a big birthday. I literally have been that guy that's like, oh, shoot, my wife's birthday is tomorrow because I've been so busy. Now I have somebody proactively looking out on the family calendar. Hey, don't forget, your wife's birthday is coming up in a month. Have you thought about a birthday present? Where's her birthday party going to be at? What do you want to do? Where do you want to have it at? Date night. What restaurant do you want to try? So it's just like the work-life integration really being proactive and looking out in advance in the future and just making sure you prioritize what you want to prioritize in life. That's, I think that's the, awesome. I, I think, Dave, the EA role is the number one missing role in all of finance. You look at any Fortune 500 CEO, they all have an executive assistant. You look at any top performing financial advisor in our space, almost none of them have an executive assistant. I think it's the number one gap in most financial services firms. Wow. I love the, what you said, Belay, <clears throat> you recommended them to me. I'm using them as well. Um, so, awesome. and it's been, it's been excellent. So now, As, what were you, were you able to about, on the, on the first, was the first hire the one, or did you go through a couple before you found the right one? Currently is the one right now. Awesome. It's That's only great. been a few months, but it's already, and then you, you figure out stuff that you wouldn't have thought about unless you actually had someone who was there to support you and to, to take some of these things off your plate. So if you can't think of things that they would do now, which I'm sure you can, you know, if you're listening to this, uh, there's even more that comes up when, when you hire somebody. Um, so now let's go back. Okay, solo person, hears this, hires the EA or the VA, and they're doing 20, 10 hours a week, and they're, they're taking some of these big things on a do not do list, taking over, freeing up time. But then there's this, this thing that you gotta do, which is people management. Most advisors mm -hmm. don't get into the business to do people management. Some are good at it. I'm horrible at it. Um, and then as you if you continue to grow, then you've got this group of people and you want to make sure everyone's doing the right thing and things are moving forward and you become almost like a project manager if you're the if you were solo and now you've got a group and then this idea of culture comes into play and all these new things which for a lot of people it's like well i didn't really sign up for that i want to talk to people and help them with their their finances and help them make good financial decisions how that's to me it seems like a hard transition. Do you have any advice when it comes to this idea of maybe it's leadership, leadership and management, two different things. Maybe it's making sure everyone's on the same, you know, rowing in the same direction, vision. What's your advice to someone who is now they've crossed that first barrier and they're almost still going down because now they're training people, uh, they're, they're writing processes and systems. How, what's your advice for that person to get to the next level of, working with a team oh there's just so many places to go with that um it is it is a common struggle um it's actually it's you know the book what got you here won't get you there it's that 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 is it's so i see it over and over and it's super frustrating to a lot of advisors because it's almost you hit this ceiling of complexity and you're not sure how to break through to the next level so um in simplest form if you want to scale any business of substance, it, as a successful financial advisor, it flips from a solo player game to a multiplayer game. And the tough part about being a great financial advisor is almost every single advisor I've ever met in life started out as a solo game. In fact, most of them got horrible training, um, kind of thrown in the deep end, and they were the one that didn't drown. Everybody else in their class, 20, 50, 100, everybody else is like out. They're washed out of the business. They were the one that figured it out. They grinded their way through it. They problem solved their way through it. They were a survivor. And what's so tough is the moment you flip over and you have to start empowering a team, it's so frustrating when the advisor that's been doing this 10, 15, 20 years has all this knowledge in their brain by the school of hard knocks, and they have to slow down. They have to watch somebody blow a couple sales, fall on their face, skin their knees, and not lose their mind and have a calm demeanor about it. And it's like parenting, Dave, right? Mm -hmm. And if you want your kids to be anything in life, they're going to have to stumble a few times along the way. They're going to have to build character. And you're going to have to be patient. And you're going to have to allow that to happen. And so that's kind of the first mindset. You have to, you have to start with patience. 
and empathy and go back to that time when you were the 20 something year old advisor just getting into it and re realize like they're not going to come into it with the same skill set that you did 20 years later. The second thing that comes to mind, you mentioned it, vision. No one can follow anyone that doesn't know where they're going. Hmm. Or if they do, you're all going to be scattered running all over the place and it's going to be a whirlwind of chaos every day. And so taking a second, um, we typically coach on three years. It, it's long enough out there that you can make dramatic changes, but it's not so far out, it's unattainable. And so we work and we coach on a three-year vision and really clarifying what that looks like. And if you think about it, like we were just out in Vegas together, think about like the Vegas Strip for those that have been there. You can look out and you can see, you know, the Caesars or, or you know, the kind of notable uh, casinos. And you're not exactly sure how far down it is, but you know, hey, if I just keep walking in that direction, I'll get there eventually. That's a great vision. You don't have to have the how you're going to get there. In fact, a great vision, you shouldn't have the how. It should be aspirational. It should be. We're not exactly sure how we're going to get there, but we're going to find a way. We're going to empower a team. We're going to all work together for the collective goal of the vision. So vision, alignment, then how do you align the team to execute on that? Then execution. Most financial services firms, it's execute, 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 whirlwind, 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 appointments, appointments, chaos. Oh, shoot, we didn't hit our goal for this year. Oh, we uh, had five people quit on this. And then they wonder why. Well, nobody knew where they were going. It wasn't a compelling vision. Look, Elon Musk, the one thing that guy knows how to do, I'm not saying I agree with all of his work practices and, and his hiring and firing and all that, but I will tell you what the guy knows how to do. He knows how to create a compelling vision. We're going mm -hmm. to Mars. We're, we're building a rocket that's reusable. We're building sustainable uh, transportation with Tesla. He knows how to create a compelling vision and the right people join that. The people that aren't scared of working 100 hours of work, but they are going to get a person to Mars, that's who's at SpaceX right now. And so it starts there. And then the culture side of it, there's one other thing. Our industry tends to look at the team as an expense versus an investment. Mm -hmm. And if you look at building a team, like Dave, if I'm like, man, this guy's pretty good at what he does. He crushes it on YouTube. He's a pretty intelligent guy. I think he builds great financial plans for, for his client. Man, I'd love to have Dave on the team. The only way I'm going to get a Dave Zoller is if I have a compelling vision and then I have a culture that attracts great talent and great humans and I pay them incredibly well. I have great benefits. Um, you look at most financial services firms when they're small, they have no 401k, they have no match, they have no health care. It's literally like, look at any baseline business out there, benefits. You need to be, that should be the minimum, is health care, some sort of retirement plan, some sort of match, some sort of, you know, vacation package. And then if you want to hire great talent, they're already working somewhere. They already have a great job. They're probably getting loved on by their current company because they don't want to lose them. And so you have to look at acquiring great talent. This is one of the things I've learned at, at Triad. We've gone from zero to 60 team members in about two and a half years. Screwed a lot up along the way. But one thing we've learned, no different than you need to, if you're going to acquire clients to your firm, go from prospect to client, you need to have great marketing, and then you need to have a great process that attracts them that your firm is better than the one they're at or the one down the street. I see so many advisors that are incredibly gifted at that with their own clients. And then they suck at that with their own team. What's really interesting is many of the same dynamics there actually apply to a team. You need to sell a great team member on, here's why our place is better than where mm -hmm. you're at. Here's the competitive package. We're going to invest into you. Um, great talent. You should be 10, 20% above market. You know, if, if this role is a 50K role industry-wide in your marketplace, you're going to need by the way, that person that's already at a firm and already happy, they're not making a lateral move. Human psychology does not like change. So if you're offering 50K, which is exactly what they're making with a similar benefits package, you are never going to get that individual. If you are now at 60K with a compelling vision, and here's where we're going, and we want to invest in you, and we want a career track, not a job, where you can grow once you're inside of this firm, okay, now that person perks up their head. Now like, huh, 10K pay raise? oh, I have a career, you know, maybe it's marketing. So if you look at your business, sorry, I'm just fire hosing here, but I'm mm -hmm. just giving you my stream of consciousness. So the biggest leap is from financial advisor to business owner. 
you now have to look at it as a business. So now I have divisions. I have a marketing division. That's the before. Mm -hmm. That manufactures the appointments. I have sales, which is the during, the conversion process. I have ops, which is the after, which is following through on the promises we make, the plans we build. Mm -hmm. So now I need who's, I go from tasks, like, hey, Dave, will you do this? Oh, what should I do? That's the constraint. If Dave is the advisor in charge, every task has to run through Dave. If I move into phase two, which is business owner, now Dave invests in great talent, talent in marketing, sales, ops. Typically the last division an advisor leaves is sales because they're, they're the one making the sales. Yeah. But you might have a director of marketing. Now I'm gonna go from task delegation to I've got a person that I've empowered to have responsibility over the marketing. We use a framework called 108010. The front 10% is the ideation, which would be Dave, the founder, meeting with person responsible for marketing. Hey, I'm thinking we might want to do some dinner seminars. Why don't you look at some local venues that are within 30 minutes of our office? And let's, you know, they need to be kind of upper level, Roost Chris level. Let's see what they are and bring those back. To me. Now you've delegated responsibility. They're doing the middle 80, which is the work. So front 10% ideation, middle 80% them, empowering them. Here's the missing piece for most advisors. Last 10%, quality control. This mm. is why people get scared to delegate because they're like, I gave, I gave them the task and then they were hosting the next seminar, at, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the buffet, the, what are those, Golden Canyon, yeah. right, or whatever they're called, Coyote Canyon. So because there was no quality control on the back end where you basically yeah. check their work. And so that last 10 is like, okay, I like these two. Let's get dates set. Okay, cool. And then after a few iterations of that, now it's just a system and a business. And so that's kind of that second phase is move into business owner, which is empowering and investing in great team and talent and then getting the hell out of their way. Honestly, that's what Ron Carson told me. He said, number one thing that's contributed to my success is I hire great people and I get the hell out of their way. Hmm. I love that. That 1080-10, that's super helpful. You said advisor and then kind of graduating to business owner. I want to ask about the, do you know any advisors? Do you have any stories of advisors who ha know the, the, the kind of paths, two paths they can take, but they don't want to be the business owner? Do they end up hiring the CEO or do they, is that an option for people? Or do you just stay the solo and you have a small team and that's good? You know what I mean? Like what if you don't wanna be mm -hmm. the business owner? Yeah. So there's a few frameworks out there. So the short answer is yes, Dave. Um, and th that's what I love. That's one of the things that just, that's why I've never gotten tired of this business. There's so much freedom to build a business that suits you and serves you in this space. Like look at your story. You're like, I started creating YouTube videos. You came up with a unique, marketing funnel that served you and how you wanted to build a firm. And guess what? Some people like, I hate doing YouTube videos. They're not going to do that. Um, so here are the four phases of scale that we coach to. There's the advisor in charge model, which is typically where you start. You're the solo practitioner surrounded by a bunch of ass assistants, right? Like very generalized roles. The second phase is bus business first or business owner. We now divide the business into an actual business with a marketing division, a sales division, an ops division. You can now start to hire leaders in each of those divisions, typically like a director of marketing, a director of ops. You mentioned like uh, most advisors do not like personnel. Great salespeople tend to have not great follow through, not great like accountability. And so you have to hire your complement. Your differences are your strengths in business. So in Colby, that would be a high follow through where most advisors are high quick starts if you're good salespeople. Um, so you might hire a high attention to detail that handles a lot of the personnel to free you up for sales. The third phase is CEO. Um, and so phase one, we delegate tasks. Phase two, we delegate responsibility. Phase three, we delegate the thinking. So we're now kind of a COO level. They're thinking about the ops. They're coming and bringing ideas to you. Ideally, they're a specialist in this with the track record of doing this before. And so now as CEO, and we'll get to like, if you don't want to be CEO in a second, CEOs are responsible for vision for the team, where we're headed, and inspiration. Like, it's kind of the, um, the Mel Gibson Braveheart scene where he's got his face mm -hmm. all painted and he's in front of the group riding the horse. It's like, that's a great CEO. It's like, an inspiring vision that people want to follow. 
COO is more the day-to-day execution. And then phase four is board member, where I have shares in the company, but I do not have to show up on a daily basis. And so where I've seen to your question where founding advisors can kind of pick their own path, I've got an advisor, uh, we've got an advisor in Chicago we work with, he'll bring in, their firm will bring in north of 200 million this year, organically. Um, They're not buying firms and rolling them up. And so back to marketing, sales, ops. Most advisors where they leave last is sales because they're responsible for the revenue, right? They're they're meeting with clients and, you know, some founding advisors will bump their minimums to a million, two million, three million. They've got an advisor team that maybe see the lower ones. But if you want to remove yourself like Anthony did, the advisor up in Chicago, he actually wanted to rain make. That was what he loved. He loved the marketing. Similar to what you're doing right now, Dave, you're rain making through YouTube. You're, you're generating appointments for a team. That was his unique desire. That was what kind of brought him joy. He's the TV guy. He's the YouTube guy. He's the seminar guy, which, by the way, he's got a family. His seminar speaking days, he just retrofits his day. He takes the whole morning off. He does breakfast with his kids. He drives them to school because a lot of seminars, they'll be like, I'm not missing family dinners. That's why I don't do seminars. He's like the most valuable hour. He makes about $40,000 of revenue every time he speaks every hour because of the ROI of talking with an audience full of qualified people. So it's one of the most valuable things he can do on a daily basis. So he just retrofit his day to where on seminar nights, he might hit the spa. He takes, he hangs with the kids in the morning, drives them to school. So he doesn't have this guilt of like, I'm sacrificing my family Mm -hmm. to build this business. He just, he just retrofits it. And then he looks forward, you know, what could it make possible if you actually looked forward to seminar days? And so Mm -hmm. he changed his seminar routine and day to where those are some of his favorite days. He loves speaking in front of an audience. He goes and crushes it. And it's one of the most valuable things he could do to drive revenue to the firm. And then he's got a guy named Brian on his team. All he does, he owns the sales division. So Anthony is making it rain appointments onto the calendar. Brian, all he does is he's their head sales guy. He did north of 100 million. I think it was like 108 million last year of new assets gathered by one individual on the team. Because back to the cash register analogy, all Brian did was sat at the cash register all day. He has no service work. He has no planning, no follow through. He just sits and connects all day long, every day. And so when you start to, so you go from generalist in the advisor in charge model to specialist. And what Anthony has developed is a specialist in that role and in many other roles in his firm, which by the way, if you're going to build and attract a great team and a great culture and great talent, Great talent wants a career, not a job. So, hey, inside of our firm, you start here, and then here's the next step and the next step, and you could, if you do really well, get up to here. And by running this like a business, not like a financial advisor, you actually start to build these career tracks inside of your firm where people are like, oh, cool, there's opportunity there. That sounds like a good opportunity that I'm willing to to jump from where I'm at. Wow. This is exciting. This is great, great stuff, at least for me. Super valuable. Well, hey, Fred. Hey, back to your YouTube. Like, if it's only you, cool. Mission accomplished. So, yeah. No, there's going to be a lot. There's a lot of advisors um, on Streamline My Practice that are going to they're going to love this. Um, we've got two minutes. Can you summarize in two minutes? You you've got do business, do life. Family is is above work, right? A lot of it's easy to get burnt out, especially if you love what you do. It's easy to work and and work and always be thinking about work. How do you focus on your family? How do you be that dad and also be a successful (laughs) entrepreneur and advisor? What's it? just a a framework or idea or tip? Well, first off, I've screwed all this up along the way, Dave. So um, nobody's perfect at this. And anybody that says they are is lying to you. Um, There is no manual for being the world's best husband or the world's best dad. Um, But I think it starts with intention. And Almost, I think universally, every advisor that I've ever talked with that is married, that has kids, or someday hopes to, to you know, have kids, they all have the intent. Um, but the intent with that, the way I try to live life is by design, not by default. And back to, I don't know how you'll slice and dice this video, but somewhere along the way, we just talked about an EA. Um, what gets calendar gets done. And so one of the things we do in my family, um, there's, there's actually, I think I've heard this story the first time in Sunday school growing up. Um, it was, maybe you heard it, Dave. It was the parable of where there's this, this empty pitcher and, 
you know, this guy puts these rocks in it. And he says, is the pitcher full? And the kid says, yes. He's like, oh, okay. And then he takes some sand and he pours it in the pitcher. And he says, how about now? And the kid like kind of double takes and he's like, well, yeah, now it's full. Then he takes some water and he pours it in the pitcher. And the truth is a lot of advisors that I've seen that get to kind of red line burnout, just lack of balance. The way their calendar works is all of that stuff that's poured into the calendar is business first. And so what we do at the Johnson House once a year, my wife and I, it's around September, November, we sit down with Brooke, my EA, we look out over the coming year and we say, we put the big rocks in first and the big rocks are family. The big rocks are birthdays, trips, the stuff that matters that is way more important than anything business related. And now we pour the sand in, the sand could represent the business calendar and that works around the big rocks. It doesn't, we don't do the sand first and then try to jam big rocks in. And that's one of the things I've seen a lot of advisors, they try to cram the big rocks in after the business is on the calendar. It just doesn't work. And so I think it just starts with intention. Um, it starts with screwing a few things up and you create systems. Um, I've tried to just surround myself with just people that are further down the path than me, guys like Michael Hyatt that are super intentional. And what I love is like, he's, he's told me the, like, Michael, when I sat down with him, he's like, there's a point. He has five daughters. He was the CEO of Thomas Nelson. He said, I was literally on the verge of divorce because my wife sat me down and said, I feel like I'm a single mom. And this is a guy that's like such a great human and so intentional. And so I just know like if he's gone down paths of messing this up, everyone has. And so you just try to get people in your life that you can learn from, that are great mentors, that um, are people that you aspire to be like. And you just ask them. And I've found that most yeah. of them are really generous humans that just share everything. And uh, so that's that's a, awesome. a few thoughts. That could be that could be a full day conversation, Dave, but uh, that's a few thoughts from my side. Oh, it's so helpful, Brad. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that wisdom. It's super helpful. I'm glad you're in my life. You're one of those guys that you had just mentioned. Um, yeah, advisors are going to love this. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, li likewise, Dave. Uh, I've learned a lot from you as well. So great to be connected with you. Thanks for all you're doing out there for advisors to help them level up in business and life. And uh, yeah, hope this helps a few advisors out there and uh, uh, always down for another conversation. So just let me know. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Brad.